move on to our agenda. Ta -da. It is quarter one, week two, just as it was the last time we met, and it's September 17th. Today we'll be looking at the brain structure and function of, and throughout this year we'll talk about structure and function of the body a lot. Structure meaning anatomy, parts of. Function meaning physiology, the way things work. So by now, of course, your binder is open. Two pages are facing you, and you're writing this on the top of your agenda. Um, what did we learn about last time we met folks? 
Yeah, neuro, neurons and neurotransmission. Last time we met, we looked at the smallest unit of the nervous system, a nerve cell, the neuron. Today we're looking at the largest part of the nervous system, the brain, where a lot of neurons come together. Um, if you take a look at the back there, I took some of your pipe cleaner neuron models and put them together on a poster and a network. That's kind of how the brain is. It's a bunch of neurons all, you know, working together. Um, that's very similar to how your brain is, like those connections. Yeah. All right, let's go. Um, that's right. You know there's places to get it, right? You get it from one of these guys. You can get it from the later on. Yeah. This is our nose, right? So right up on the right, our heading for there is the mammalian brain. Um, um, does folks remember what makes a mammal a mammal? Why do we label an animal a mammal? This doesn't have to do with today's lecture, I'm just curious, yeah. So rather than lay an egg, they give, they call it just live birth, right? The, the animal comes right out ready to go, right? Um, and then all, all mommy mammals can make, from their mammary glands, so all mommy mammals can make, begins with an M? No. Um, all right, so. Alright, let's move on to our first word. So our first word today is not color-coded, it's just a straight up pen, pencil, whatever you got. It is the word cerebrum. That prefix, C-E-R-E, -E, always relates to the brain. So maybe you'll, you'll, throughout this course, throughout your life, you'll hear the words cerebral, cerebrum. Um, you'll know that that C-E-R-E -E always relates to the brain or the functioning of the brain. Alright, cerebrum. An, um, this is the superior proportion of the brain. This word superior will appear on next Friday's test. Um, what is it when something is superior? What do you think of? All right, you're thinking better because you're thinking of super. Um, what do, we, do we think of superior? Do we think high or low? High. Top or bottom? High, right? This is superior means top or above, right? So if you didn't know that and you think you'll forget it by next Friday, please write the words top or above next to superior. It's the superior portion of the brain. It analyzes stimulus. Um, who can tell, who can remind us what a stimulus is? Or I guess we should tell us who's gonna remind us. Kiara? Kiara? Why is it they sometimes trip? What's happening there? They're trying to get a balance. 
All right, they're trying to get their balance. They haven't figured out which muscles to use at which time to make this walking thing happen. And all of that occurs in the cerebellum. So what animals might we expect to have a larger cerebellum? What animals do we expect to have really good balance? Um, or perhaps a large land-walking mammal might have these amounts, right? It's got to keep itself up at a high place. Yes? A horse. Um, perhaps a horse, they have to run really fast. Um, what kind of environment do we think of animals doing a lot of acrobatics, jumping, swinging, running along small things? Um, yeah. Here we go. Go ahead. Sorry. Monkeys. All right, monkeys, right? We think of monkeys as being very acrobatic and having a lot of balance. We expect them to have fairly large cerebellum. If we look at our book here on page 25 again, um, tell me the difference between the cerebellum, that little yellow part, on the reptile versus the amphibian. Yeah, go ahead. Which one? Which one has a larger cerebellum? Wait, what? Did you the amphibian or a reptile? A cer. Wait, what? The cerebellum is that little yellow part. Oh, oh, oh the, the reptile. reptile. The reptile. All right. Where do amphibians normally live? Frogs. In the water. Ponds, right? They're kind of like down on the ground, right? Where do we think a lot of reptiles is living? Damp areas. Wait, wait, wait. Are, wait, are wait, reptiles wait. generally climbing animals? That live like in trees, jumping around. No, reptile. I mean, so there are a lot of desert reptiles, of course. Um, yeah, absolutely, good, good connection there. You know what? Um, but many reptiles are climbing animals, right? And they need to have their balance. So you'll notice that they have that well-developed um, cerebellum. Um, so you know, we're making this here that this particular reptile might be a tree-dwelling one. Um, all right. All animals have a brainstem. So we're going to use our red pencil for this today. Um, are, so in red, writing the word in red, underlining it in red, putting a box around it in red, putting a star in red, is our brain stem. Um, all right, so we have, the brain stem is also known as the reptilian brain. Um, this is a structure that all animals, from the simplest worm to the most complex whale, have a brain stem. Um, this brain stem, the reptilian brain, is in the inferior region of the brain, meaning it's where? Top, bottom, side, front, back, what? Bottom, right? It's inferior, so the bottom. Um, and it controls autonomic functions. Um, someone's going to explain to me, after their name gets pulled from the obstacle, uh, what I've done Eric. here with the word autonomic. What? All right, what have I done with the word autonomic here to make it easier for your learning? So take a look at the colors and structure of the word and what's right after it. Do your best to explain. Can I, do it? I, I, I need him to know because we use this technique all year long. I'll Thank you. Her and I'll write for her. All right, so, well, the thing is, she can't help you on my test or on the MCAS later on, so you need to know. All right, let's have a look. Um, what have I noticed? What, what's the similarity between auto and the word self? They're both compared to the nomic and the manage. What is an adjective I could use to describe auto versus auto? Tell me about depth or color, darkness or lightness. Great. Versus that, which is terrific. All right, so we have auto for self, right? I match these dark ones. And nomic for what? What does nomic mean based on this trick I've done here? Notice you are not Eric. Thank you, though. I'm excited that you know it. Um, Next time this comes up on the board, we'll call on Eric again. Uh, all right, so since we had a chance to finish this time. All right. Wait. What this means is that the brain control, uh, the brain that controls autonomic functions. Um, who might be able to give me some examples? What are things that happen in your body you don't have to think about? They happen automatically. Yes. Breathing. Breathing, right? I don't have to say all day to myself, breathe, 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 breathe. It just happens. Yes. Reflexes, Reflexes right? Someone, you know, something goes near your face, you block, right? Or you blink, right? So, um, what else? Something that happens about 70 times per minute? Brainstem is red, you said? Your heartbeat. Well, your heartbeat, right? I don't have to say to my heart every single day, pump, 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 Right? It just occurs <laughs> on its own, right? So, um, so I've got some examples here. You do not need to write them down. We can just discuss them, right? Responding to stimulus, right? You hear a loud noise, you might jump, scream, um, whatever, uh, right? Metabolism. I don't have to.
tell my stomach, digest that food. I, the food drops in the stomach, and it just kind of happens, right? I'm growing. Every night before bed, you guys are adolescents right now, you're still growing, you're still changing, you don't have to say, grow hair in my armpits, grow hair in my armpits, right? <laughs> no. It just happens naturally, because you are at that age. Um, right, so these are all things that happen without your control. Wait, don't change it, wait. You don't need to write that bottom stuff. I'm not writing the bottom stuff. All right. Lobe is at the lateral region. This is a new word. 
Lateral means sides or on the perimeter of. Right, so next to lateral, if you think you'll forget it by next Friday's test, please write the word side above it, below it, near it. Lateral meaning side of. All right, so our temporal lobes are the side of our cerebrum, on the side of our brain, and it processes auditory synthesis. Auditory is an audio, so of course, what sense are we talking about here? Oh my God. Sound and hearing, right? So this is, this is the part of our brain that takes sound information and makes meaning of it, right? We have the ability to tell the difference between the screeching tires of a car and someone saying thank you, right? The sounds are different, and our temporal lobe is what distinguishes between them. Now, the word temporal um, in our Latin Greek roots has to do with um, time, the passage of time. So you can kind of think about how sound takes a certain amount of time to travel from one place to another. And in, in the ancient thought, when they were first putting science and scientific thinking together, they thought maybe what we were doing when we heard sound is we were measuring time. What sense do we normally associate the measurement of time with right now? A clock, which is something we oh, no. see, right? So notice that over time, so over the course of human history, We've got a different perspective on how we measure things, right? Now we use our sight to measure time, but before they thought of it as more of a hearing-based thing. All right, and last moments for the four people who aren't quite there yet. The tiger's coming, it's ready to pounce, it's got its claws out, it's growling, and it's on. Um, all right. The, what senses haven't we talked about yet, folks? Um, um, Taste and smell which are actually both occurring in one part of the brain. Oh, me, I know. In our okay. blue pencil today, we have our olfactory lobe. Um, no, we're going to keep going. Now, I mentioned today's notes are a little longer. If you need to spill over onto the activity part underneath the agenda, that's all good. We're going to use the next pages for drawing. So uh, don't worry about spilling over underneath your agenda today. All right, the olfactory lobe is anterior, meaning front. And inferior meaning? Low. Low or below, low. bottom, right? So it's the front, bottom, back is posterior. Um, all right, so, so at the, the front, bottom of the cerebrum, and it processes chemical stimulus, such as smells and taste. Let's say I had a blender, and I took two brown substances, and I blended them up, and I put them in two glass bowls and put a spoon in each. One of those blended substances is chocolate pudding. Is what? Chocolate pudding. Okay. And the other blended substance is feces. Visually speaking, could I tell them apart? No, if they'd been run through the blender, they would look the same. So then why why is having smell important to us? Could you just smell the bad? Please. Oh, I'm yeah, no, she's gonna finish up. Yeah. Right, good or bad, not very specific enough. Who can elaborate on that? What What would I want to do to one of these things and not the other? Yes, Claudia. All right, it might be a toxic substance versus something that is what? The opposite of toxic would be healthy or nutritious, right? Right. So this sense of smell and taste gives us the ability to distinguish between different molecules, things we can and should eat, versus things we should discard or get away from. All right, now actually, we talked about our five physical senses, but there's one sense we haven't discussed yet, a sense that many of you may or may not have. Um, a sense that maybe sometimes people accuse you of not having when you've done something stupid. A, br uh, a brain, a mind, a, th um, a very a thing. Oh, I say it again. People say this person all the time, don't you have any sense? No, I'm not sense. Common sense. Whatever. Good to work, folks. Like, close right. Enough. In purple today, for in purple for our frontal lobe, we're going to look at the brain that is your common sense part of your brain. This is an anterior, so it's in the front. Um, this is the region of the cerebrum that processes reasoning and thoughtful responses to both internal things happening inside your body. Oh, yeah. Purple, please. And external. It's happening outside of your body. Stimulus.
takes information from your olfactory, from your occipital, from your parietal, from your temporal, puts all that information together and creates a scenario, a situation. Right now, based on the things you are seeing, based on the things you are hearing, you know you are in what kind of place? A classroom, right? You know that okay, I can see desks, I can hear instruction happening, um, right? Um, I can feel that, you know, I'm at a chair, like I can feel pressure on my bottom, right? I can feel that my feet are on the floor, I know that I am sitting, therefore I must be in a classroom right now, right? So this frontal lobe takes all the information that's happening, puts it all together and creates a representation. Let's say, for example, um, you've got a family member or a friend who makes a really knockout macaroni and cheese. You go to visit their home, you walk into the house, you smell the aroma of sizzling cheese in the oven. You sit down at the chair, you feel the pressure of the chair on your back and on your legs. That person walks over to you with a bowl full of this product they have removed from the oven with a spoon in it. They make eye contact, they smile, you see them. They say to you, here, please enjoy this thing. And then you shriek in terror, flip over the table and run out of the room. <laughs> Is that a reasonable and thoughtful response? No, right? Like, what happened is you took all the information from your senses and you said, what is the appropriate response in that moment, of course? <laughs> to clutch the spoon with your claws and consume it, right? Right, so thinking about how this frontal lobe allows you to make good decisions based on everything you're experiencing, right? You talk to your friends at home a different way than you talk to your teacher in school, hopefully. All right, our next batch of notes, we've got three more things to go. Again, you can spill over um, onto the next slide if you need to. I assume we got wrong, All right. Um, you'll notice again, pace high school pretty quick. Now, our brain is also divided into two halves. We have our right hemisphere and our left hemisphere, and they each engage in a different kind of thinking. All right, so our right hemisphere, the right side of our brain, no colors, what kind of no colors. we've used our colors, we're good to go. We're just, this is just straight up pen pencil. Um, analyzes shapes, analyzes colors, analyzes rhythms, and generates what's known as abstract thought. Um, your right hemisphere, in, in essence, controls your ability to think creatively. Um, it's what allows you to have what are known as original thoughts, to arrange thoughts, colors, shapes, things in ways that have never been done before. It allows you to create art, right? It allows you to create something new and interesting that the universe has never been held before. So a lot of people are considered what is right brain dominant meaning they're really strong, creative thinkers. They're very musical. They're, very, they're really good at drawing. They're um, really good at writing interesting poetry. Right? Their ability to think abstractly is their strongest suit. And that's generally not the focus of a traditional academic scholastic environment, right? How many of you guys are coming from K through eight situations that had art as part of the program? You'll notice it's less or around half of the hands in the room, right? So generally we focus on something else. Who remembers what the three R's are of school? The three R's? Oh yeah, D different thing. I see where you're going with that though. I remember that's a whole other acronym. Um, generally what we think of at school is we're trying to strengthen your left hemisphere thinking. So the left side of the brain, our new word that's up on the board, for those that are far away and haven't started writing it yet, whose name I might have to call if they don't start writing, um, the uh, left hemisphere is the side of the brain that analyzes arithmetic, your ability to do what? What is arithmetic again, folks? Math. 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 Your ability to read, to look at symbols on a piece of paper and know what they mean, and your ability to write to generate those symbols and create something meaningful on a piece of paper. Your left hemisphere is what's known as your logical brain, right? Things that are linear and make sense. You know, if I look at a piece of paper and the letters T, H, E are present, I know it is the word what? the, right? T, H, E is the, that's a logical thought, right? 
I know how to pronounce it. I know how to use it in a sentence, in a logical sentence, right? Um, so now we'll get back to our three R's. Many of you in your K-8 experience may have heard of the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Though they all don't start with an R, they have the R sound, right? That's a big goal of school that you can graduate from high school being able to read, write, and do arithmetic, the three R's. R's. Um, all right, people that are left hemisphere dominant, these are the folks that are really good at math. These are the folks that are really good at computers. These are the folks that, you know, can write a mile a minute or, you know, they just bang out a thousand words, um, right? That their strongest areas are these things. Is there another one? Yeah. One more word and we're, and we're wrapping up on our notes. Now, um, because the two hemispheres are doing something different, we have to bridge these things together, and that is done through our corpus callosum. Um, so our corpus callosum is the part of the brain that unites the left and right. It's a bundle of nerves. You'll see it in our dissection today. It's white. It looks like a pancake. And it connects and directs, facilitates, controls, transmits information between the two hemispheres. Corpus means body. Colossum, kind of like a column or the Colosseum. Um, so it has that shape of being columnar when it's opened up. The, uh, so this bundle of nerves connects these two things. This is what allows you to combine the skills of reading and writing with colors, rhythms, and whatnot. This is what allows you to do something like write music or read music. This is what allows you to create art that combines shapes and words. This is what allows you to write poetry, right? You need to be able to write, which is a left hemisphere skill, and you need to be able to generate abstract thoughts, such as a poem. What happens in poems a lot? when you're writing a poem. Our, our, uh, our poem is very literal. Right, like today, today I feel like black. Right, what does that mean? Do, can we all get me from that? If I say I feel very black today, what does that mean? You're like gloomy, <laughs> sad, depressed, right? That's an abstract thought. But first, you have to know what the word black is how to spell it, so on and so forth, before you can write the words, I, you know, I feel black. Great. All right. Um, does anyone know what side of the brain controls what side of the body? No. They don't know this? The left side controls the right side, the right side controls the left side. Awesome, right? So there's a, an opposite thing that happens here. The left hemisphere of your brain controls the right side of your body, whereas the right side of your brain controls the left. Um, and again, this is conducted through the corpus callosum. Can you go back to the first slide? Um, I can't because I'm going to go on to the next slide. We're going to get our drawings up next. Um, or actually, I guess, I guess I can kind of work with you halfway here. Um, let me show you the next slide first, and then we'll talk about it. Um, these were questions I asked as we went. What we're going to do next um, is... So gonna draw I'm going to steal your notebook. Your notebook. Yeah. All right. You're going to open up to the next two pages. And what's going to happen is... You're going to take this brain. Where do you see this brain on your table right now? It's better. Yeah. Page 25. You're going to copy that brain, trace it, draw it, whatever you need to do. Make this brain with most of its textures and lines happen on the right side. On the left side, you just need the outline. Outline on the left, fully textured drawing on the right. And you, of course, can use page 25 as a tracing guide. All right. Now that you have that direction, I'm happy to put one of the other slides back up. Um, you've got eight minutes in order to draw both brains before we oh. move on. Wait. Um, left side is just going to be outlined, and then our right side will be our fully textured drawing with the lines and curves and whatnot. And based on what we've done in the previous class this week, what do you think is going to happen after you draw your outline? That'll be step three. We're going to label it. I don't know. We're going to label it and color it, color it with our colors that matched our writing. Matched our writing, our notes, right? Right, so it all comes together into one cohesive package.